Uh, we're up to the point now, uh, if you uh, remember what we studied last week, we're up to the point where Samuel is going to be given to the Lord. Folks, let me remind you, so it's wonderful to make vows to God, and I encourage you to make vows to God. Uh, I, think, I think that uh, the Lord's blessed with it, but don't make a vow just to make a vow. I mean, you, you want to be sincere in it prayerful in it, and then God helping you, you'll perform those vows. Amen? Because uh, the Bible teaches us it's foolish to do any other way, okay? Well, we know that Hannah, she did make a vow to God, and she did keep it. And it came time for her child Samuel to be winged, and, and she did give him back to the Lord because of that answered prayer. And uh, we, we know that he's become and will become a great personage of God. Now, if you'll read uh, with me in chapter 1, we find out that, and when she, uh, verse 24, and when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with three bullocks and one ephah of flour and a bottle of wine and brought him unto the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the young child was young. And they slew a bullock and brought the child to Eli. I think it's good. We don't baptize babies around here, but we dedicate babies to the Lord. But I'm very fearful. Uh, everybody wants to uh, dedicate their baby to the Lord. But yet, even in their lives at the, at the current station, they have no faithfulness to God. They have no uh, they have no habits or good habits, may I say, of even wanting to serve God. And when you dedicate a child to the Lord, I mean, that, that is a beautiful thing. But there's a lot of responsibility that goes with that. And uh, we don't take it lightly. And we warn uh, the folks that we do not take it lightly. And uh, uh, from that, we can see that... that uh, God will call them to the ministry many times uh, through uh, pastors or missionaries or staff uh, personnel, support personnel, or uh, become Sunday school teachers. And I've seen this in the past. I've seen, I've seen kids in their high school, junior high, high school year that wanted to serve the Lord. And the parents didn't want their kids to serve better than they're serving. And in in uh, the end result of that conversation, those kids started chasing after the world and the family was broken and hurt because of that. And I could give you names after names of folks that you would know from the past that the kids would be excited about serving the Lord, but mom and dad didn't want them that excited. My friends, if you got children that want to serve the Lord, you do what you can to let them serve the Lord, to aid them in that way. So and you'll be the happier parent over it. And so we see that she, uh, she brought it and uh, she, she uh, came and they slew the bullock and brought the child to Eli. And she said, O oh my Lord, as thy soul liveth, my, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee here praying unto the Lord. For this child I prayed. And the Lord hath given me my petitions, which I asked of him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord, and he shall worship the Lord there. Uh, I, 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 I want to clarify here, okay? You dedicate a child to the Lord, give him to the Lord. We don't want you dropping him off at Bible Baptist Church in Enid, Oklahoma. <laughs> because my name is not Eli. And we don't have an Eli on the staff. So you take that child and raise them up in the Lord's house, okay? And teach them the ways of God. I just want to be clear about that because I know sometimes you want to drop off your children here and just leave them. But no, no, you can't do that. You got a parent, amen? And then we see in the beginning part of uh, chapter 2 that Hannah begins to pray and her hearts rejoiced because God did grant her her prayer request. And she did praise God that her enemy's mouth was now had, uh, was shut. And uh, uh, she, she was uh, rejoicing in all that. And I think that's great. 
Well, as she promised, she did give, she did give the child uh, to the Lord. And at a very young age, God began to use that child. Now, Eli, uh, he, he, judged the, he judged the world. Now, remember, we don't have kings at this time. We have judges. And he sort of helped the, he helped the uh, nation of Israel judge and stuff like this. And he put his two sons into positions of judging. And, and uh, they were no good. They were priests. They were no good. They, they, were, rotten, they were rotten kids and stuff. And, and so while Samuel, Samuel was still young, we know that uh, the Bible says he, he, my wife gets mad when I say this. I said, well, I bed down my wife, you know, now I can go to bed. She said, who talks that way? And I said, I do. Well, Samuel bedded down Eli, got him in bed and everything. And ere before the light of the, of the sanctuary went out, or just before the light of the sanctuary went out, uh, Samuel was in bed, okay? And he, go, he goes to sleep and he's wakened by the voice of what he thought was Eli calling out to him. And so as a dutiful young man, a man that respected uh, God uh, and uh, Eli, uh, he, he went running to him. And the Bible says in verse 4, And the Lord called, and now this is in chapter 2, uh, uh, chapter 3, excuse me. He says, And the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, Here am I. And he ran unto Eli and said, Here am I, for thou callest me. And he said, I call not, lie down again. And he went and laid down. You know, he, he heard him calling for him. And so he immediately ran. Now, the first time, you know, it, you could be mistaken. Have you ever woke up sort of right after you go to sleep and, you know, so, surely somebody hollered out for me or something like that and nobody did. Uh, and so... He goes running in there, probably waking Eli up. And Eli said, go to bed, young man. It's okay. I didn't call for you. He said, okay. So he does go back to bed. And uh, uh, so, the Lord, uh, so the Lord called him uh, yet again, Samuel. And Samuel rose and went to Eli and said, here am I, for thou didst call me. And he answered, I call not, my son, lie down again. Now, he speaks in a manner of, I didn't go back to sleep. And already I heard you call my name. Now, you did call for me. And he said, no, I didn't. But he knew, he just knew he called for him because he heard his name. Who else is around? Eli. And Samuel. And so he said, no, you, you, go, you go lie down again. Now, uh, uh, and now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. And the Lord called him again the third time, and he arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. Now, here's the deal now. Again, I don't believe Samuel went back to sleep and he heard his name again. He goes running back into Eli and he says, oh no, no, I did hear my name called out. I'm here. Now, I don't think, just personally, now it doesn't show, but I don't think after the first time, that uh, 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 Eli went back to sleep. He said, how do you know that? Turn old and I'll tell you why. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Isn't that right? It takes a while to get back to sleep. And he's sitting there thinking, and this third time, you know, Eli probably after the second time's wondering, the third time, Eli knows what's going on because Eli used to have a conversation with God. He knew God. And so now he's beginning to perceive that God is talking to this young man. Now, what would that do to Eli? In my mind, that would sort of be neat, but also heart-wrenching. 
God's quit talking to me now. Isn't that right? The Lord quit talking to me and he knew why. And so, uh, therefore, uh, uh, he said in verse 9, Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go, lie down, and it shall be. If he call thee, thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. So Samuel went and laid down in his place. So Eli knows what's going on. And the Lord came and stood and called as other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel doesn't go run along. He's an obedient child. The Bible says, so Samuel answered, speak for thy servant heareth. What I like about Eli, Eli taught him how to speak properly to the Lord. He knew how to speak properly. I'm listening, Lord. Speak to me. My friends, we need to be in such a communication with the Lord, we can speak properly to the Lord. Amen. Remember when you first started praying and how you felt maybe a little bit silly because you've never prayed before? Then as you pray and grow in prayer, and it's not that you become pious, but... As you grow in the Lord, your prayers ought to be better. You find somebody that's been saved for 30 years and they're praying like a newborn uh, baby Christian. I'm going to tell you somebody that hasn't prayed. They just haven't been praying like they ought to. And I'm not counting those times when you don't know what to pray. You know, you say, Lord, and you might be a prayer warrior. You say, Lord, I, I, uh, help. Amen. How many's ever prayed that prayer, help? I have. That's all I said, help. And so we have this. And, and so he, he, uh, uh, he said, I'm, I'm going to hear you. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel at which both the ears of everyone that heareth it shall tingle. Now, you say, how is that? What he's explaining is that something's getting ready to happen that just brings a shiver to the soul. It's going to shock the nation. And we know what it is. We'll be studying here in a little bit. But he said this. He's telling Samuel, in that day I will perform against Eli all things which I have spoke concerning his house. When I begin, I will also make, it, uh, make an end. Now, for a little boy that loves Eli, and the Lord's coming and saying, I'm, I'm now speaking against Eli. What do you think Samuel's feeling as a, as a little fella? Heartbroken. You say, well, where do you get this? Man, they're just people like we are. If you got bad news about somebody, and you, don't, you don't want to share it. And Eli knows there's some bad news about him. And he's going to be challenging him on it. And the hard thing that Samuel has to tell him. And he said this. He says, I have told him that I will judge his house for how long? Forever. He says, that which I begin in the verse uh, previous, he says, that which I will begin, I will also make an end. He says, it, I'm going to carry through on it. He says, forever the iniquity which he knoweth. He said, the iniquity that he knoweth, he's going to give answer for, because his sons made themselves vile, and he restraineth them not. My friends, this is why as a parent... We've got to love our children into obedience. Amen. Because we have to give answer to God. Amen. You say, well, well, what would have his boys done because they're young and married? Well, if, if they'd been right of heart, I don't care how old your parents are, you give them some respect. Yes, ma'am, mom. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> yes, ma'am. 
she'll sometimes she doesn't get after me. She encourages me in Jesus sometimes. And uh, I, I, I give her respect for it. I mean, she's she's been on this earth twice as long as I have. Let me see. I'm about I, I'm 60. I'm 60. So. Is that not showing her respect? <laughs> OK. <laughs> but, you know. You can learn something. Amen. And Eli, he just he just should have just said, boys. No. No, no. It's against God. You can't do this. This isn't right. And if they were if they were raised right, even though they're they're terribly backslidden or out of God's will, they'll know if you've lived your life righteous before their eyes. Now, there's a lot of things that works here. Have you lived your life righteous before your children? Are you saying something that you don't practice? But if you live your life righteous and holy, boy, you know, you come to church and out of your mouth comes uh, beautiful songs of love to God and you go home and you cuss like a sailor. And I'm just talking about the ladies. <laughs> it didn't used to be that way, but it is. Young girls talk, have filthy mouth. And the boys, oh my goodness. But if you're, if you're trying to raise them up in God and you're not living right, you know, testimony's everything. Amen. And so we have, we have this. He says, now I'm going to judge him for it because his sons made themselves vile. They had control over that. And therefore I have sworn into the house of Eli that the iniquity of Lehi's house shall not be purged with sacrifice nor with offering forever. You know, uh, the book of uh, uh, 1 John says there comes a time in a, in a saved person's life where they've sinned against God. And he said, you might as well not even pray for it. Amen. You have angered the Lord. You know, the Bible talks about and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Yeah. Grieve the Spirit of God. My friends, as a parents, my, my brothers and my young brothers and sisters in Christ, some of them are in grade school here and some of them are in high school. Now, let me tell you something. If you're saved, be careful. Be careful. And you go ahead and read ahead. We'll be talking about it in the near future. But you look what happens to those people and see what what even happens to Eli. So he was called at a, at a very early age. At the very first, he did not recognize the voice of the Lord. But you know what? In that, Eli still taught him how to surrender to the call. I think Eli, now again, this is surmising. You say, well, chapter and verse. Cha no, this is surmising. I'm thinking that Eli screwed up on his two boys. And he saw that, that he had Samuel. And I think he did Samuel different. He wanted to do Samuel the right way. And I think Samuel, I believe he loved him as, a, as his own child and everything. And he wanted him to do right. And I'm sure daily he instructed him in the ways of God and how to do. And I think God was impressed with that. He was impressed with his mother who gave Samuel to him. And I believe he was impressed with Eli, who helped him in his young age to do things for God. And I, you can see his spirit, how, how it, wonderful it is. And so he surrendered to the call. I think it's important for all of us to surrender to the call of, of our Savior and our God, and especially our young people. Oh, man, you get a, you get a youth department with the, the kids in there, spiritual and I'm telling you something, a church has something. Amen. Now, you listen to me. A church has something. When you get uh, grade school, junior high and high school kids that, 
that truly want to do it God's way and not do it for show, but really get excited about the things of God, that church is a blessed church. That doesn't go chasing after everything in the world, but chases after, after the things of God. Boy, that church, that's the, that's the youth department I would like to have here. And many of our kids do love God that much. They, they are Christians when they're around Christians, but they are the ones who go to school and they're still Christians. They, they still love God. They want, they want to present themselves as, as God's people. They're not ashamed. Somebody did something that just sort of shocked me, and I can't remember. If somebody, I didn't think, for some reason, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know how they felt about God. And the first thing they did is they said, first of all, I want to testify about my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who saved me. And it shocked me for some reason because I didn't, for, for some reason, I didn't, I didn't think that they, they would even acknowledge God. And yet they did. And it's surprising the kids that you don't think would acknowledge God are the leaders who will take a youth group and not just at the church, but will take a youth group even at school and create a Christian environment. I love that. And all of our children are capable of doing that if they will. Okay. And so, so he surrendered to his call. Now, Samuel was used of God, and he'll be used throughout his long life. He will have a fruitful life. You know, he was known as God's prophet. In the book of Samuel, chapter 3, and verse 20. And uh, uh, let me see. Is that what I want? Uh, Boy, my, my old glasses, I just can't. He says, And all of Israel from Dan even to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. I, I was just, a, a thought came to my mind, and I, I need to research it. But there's another place, and I believe it's in the New Testament, and I, I'm sorry, I, it, the, the thought just literally, did you see it just pop in my brain? Did you, did you hear my, my brain crackle just right then? It just went. But it seems like, and maybe one of you can look at it real quick and shout it out to me. But uh, it seems like there is a place in the New Testament that, that was talking about the prophets. And they started off with Samuel the prophet. And then it was uh, one verse and went to the others. And... Uh, Samuel, probably the first prophet. But, but uh, God used him in a great way. And, and uh, he was a miraculous, a miraculous God because his mama gave him to him and Eli trained him to be. And so uh, they, they knew he was a, a, a prophet. Next of all, he was a judge. And probably, no, I know this. He was the last, judge, uh, uh, the last judge of all the judges. In the book of 1 Samuel chapter 7, in verse 15. And Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. Now you remember, they did not have, they did not have, they did not have kings. They had judges. We studied a judge not too long ago, didn't we? What was his name? Samson. Samson. And he got out of God's will, but you know, God wasn't done with him yet. <laughs> Isn't that right? You can get out of God's will, but if you go back, God, God's not done with you yet. He's not done. And so uh, we, have, we have him being the last judge, and he will be the one who appoints a king. We're just going to talk about that here in a second. But... If you'll read 1 Samuel chapter uh, 7, and not right now, 
because you're trying to find another scripture instead of listening to me. Did you find it? Acts 13, 20. Acts 13:20. Read it. There you go. And afterward they desired a king and God gave unto them. Okay. See? See what I was saying? Acts 3.24. Acts 3.24 too? Also as in T-O-O. Okay. What's it say? Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after it, many of them spoken, have likewise foretold There you go. Okay. And I, I, it, like I said, just popped in my brain. Uh, uh, so you've got two places there. It was Acts 13, 20, and Acts 3, 24. Okay, so there you have it for those who are on the Internet. You say, boy, you're a weird preacher. Hey, there's a lot of stuff in this book. <laughs> I don't... I've, I've got a lot, a lot of stuff memorized, and sometimes I just I have stuff memorized, but I don't know where the address is at. I have to do like everybody else. I have to go back and study it. But I knew there was a place that Samuel was the first prophet, okay? But he was the last judge. And uh, it happened. It started happening. And, oh, I was going to tell you, read chapter 7. Read chapter 7. And then... See and see how this coincides with today. The children of Israel are in captivity with the, with the Philistines. And I'm telling you something, folks. When sin's got a hold of you, what I suggest is that you get down on your knees and start crying. Yeah, I'm telling you, I think you ought to start crying. The nation of Israel, they were enslaved. And, and my friends, they're trying to do this. And I don't care if I make somebody unhappy here. I'm not talking politics. I don't try to talk politics in the, in the pulpit. I'm talking freedom. They're trying to bring something to our nation that will enslave all of us. Ask Russia, the citizens of Russia, how that's working out for them. Right. Ask the ci citizens of China how that's working out for them. Ask the citizens of China whether they'd rather be American or whether they'd love to live in China. Right. Ask the citizens of North Korea, <clears throat> would you rather live here or where you're at? I guarantee you. They would come to this land. Amen. And we've got people, a minority, plus a news function, who's pushing us into slavery. And it's because we're no different than Israel. We've turned our back on God. We're chasing the things of the world. Listen to me. We're chasing the things of the world. And, and we're going to find ourselves like them. And 40 years later, we're going to be on our knees as Christians crying out to God, deliver us, deliver us, deliver us, deliver us, deliver us. When we shouldn't even be put in this position anyway. Amen. Right. Amen. Well, I tell you, folks, I, I trust in God. But boy, I tell you. We don't, need, we don't need socialism, which is nothing but communism. So in 1 Samuel chapter uh, 10, verse 1, they said, we want to be like everybody else. We want a king. And Samuel goes to God, and I, I'm just sort of working this. They want a king. He says, let's give it to him. But you tell him, you want a king. This is what's going to happen to you. They had a good with Samuel. But I'll give you a king, and here's what he's going to do. And that first king did whatever God said he would do. <clears throat> Not only did he anoint him, he anointed David to replace Saul. 
he got so bad that even before God kicked him out of out of the out of the throne, he had already replaced him. First Samuel chapter sixteen, verse twelve to thirteen, and he sent he brought him in. Now he was a ruddy, uh, Rudy, or and withal of a beautiful uh, countenance and goodly to look on. You girls down here, you'd think he was a handsome little feller. He redhead before you say ooh. He was a ginger. That's what they call redheads, isn't it? He was a ginger. Man, look at that young feller there. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. My friends... It got so bad that God says, okay, I'm already looking for somebody else. And he went to a whole different family. And Saul's family had to be destroyed. There's one little fellow there. He couldn't take care of himself that David took to himself and took care of him. But who was David's dear friend? Jonathan? Jonathan. He did not go against David, but actually helped him. But he would have had to take the throne, and Jonathan had to die. Parents, we're responsible. We're responsible. Oh, Saul, what did he do? He committed suicide, basically. Didn't he? Yep. Didn't have to be that way. Samuel, we're going to look at his life a little bit later. Samuel had problems with kids, too. He did. They were on the take. <laughs> they were on the take. God, got to put God in your life, parents. Yeah. You can't do it with just your mouth. You got to do it with your life. Amen. My mom's sitting over here, the one that's twice as old as me. I saw a lady that was 104 years old today, had a birthday. Man, 104. Isn't that something? I can't remember what I was going to say. What was I saying? I don't remember. <laughs> this happens to me a lot. Do you remember what I was talking about? Huh? Yeah, I know, but what was I talking about before that? <laughs> About being parents. <laughs> exactly. You say, what's wrong with you, folks? I'm 60. <laughs> That's what I just said. My mom's twice as old as me. She's 120. Yeah. She looks good for 120, doesn't she? Well, I've been 120. She drives 120 miles an hour. But seriously, our kids are so important. And we need to push them to godliness. We really do. And if they're saved, it's not going to be too much of a push. It'll be just a little nudge every now and then. Here's what I was going to say. I just remember. Thank you, Lord. Parents, you've got to live your life spotless in front of your kids. So they'll respect what you're feeding them. You say, but I'm not perfect. Nope. And I think they understand that. But when you go out of your way to say one thing and then do another, here's another thing I was getting ready to say. My mother and my dad, 
They taught us something that your mom and dad probably taught you. Your actions speak louder than your words. Did you ever hear that from your parents? Have you? Have you? Have you ever said that, mother? Yeah. Have you ever heard that, little brother? Have you ever said it? You keep saying it. You keep saying it. Because Uncle Terry, he's mean. I just hurt my knee coming down out of the pulpit just a while ago. I was getting ready to tell him I, I kick him in the seat of the bridge, but I don't think I can raise my leg up that high now. You say, well, you're making light. No, I'm serious. I'm serious. Folks, we've got a responsibility to God. Amen. As teenagers, I want to encourage you to chase after God and be great. Be great. There might be a friend of yours that have, has a horrible home life. And you can show them the love of God. You don't know what that, that, that friend of yours can be for God. And they'll always look back at you and say, you're the reason. I remember a story, Mrs. Ulatala. If I don't get it right, forgive me. But there was a, there was a friend of hers, I guess, that used to come over to the house quite a bit in school. If you don't remember this, you, you remember that I, you told me this, and I'm exactly right, okay? <laughs> You say, yes, brother chick, that's right. But that girl used to come over to the Bickerstaff's house. And she loved it because that house was clean. That house had God in it. And it affected her all of life. Do you remember who I'm talking about? You don't, I'll talk to you after church. But just remember that we had this conversation. But that's what your houses ought to be. God's in there so much that kids come in and they want to be there because God's there. Yes. 